Welcome to the Love the Star podcast. I'm Bobby Bell, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105 Through the Fan in Dallas. Joined as always by former NFL scout Brian Broadus, a Super Bowl winner. He is now the co host of the G Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105 Through the Fan in Dallas. You can actually see that Super Bowl trophy right over his shoulder, right, right there uh, in front of him. He is also the pre and post game co host on the Dallas Cowboys Radio Network. Brian Broadus, how are you doing today? Doing well, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh lot to get into and unpack with this Lions game. Um, some good, some bad. You know, we'll see how it plays out. It's always that time in the NFL where you're kind of trying to figure th- some some things out. And I think the Lions have figured out some things offensively, but not yeah. so sure defensively if they have. No, um, there's definitely some good parts on the defensive side of the ball for them. No question. Um, but yeah, are they are they a good unit is mm-hmm. another question completely. And it, are they a vulnerable unit? Which we'll get into all that here in a sec. I, I want to say thank you right off the bat. We mentioned you're the Super Bowl winner. I want to say thank you for flashing that Super Bowl ring occasionally, Brian, mm. because uh, I was doing Cowboys crosstalk a couple weeks ago with uh, Nate Newton. Mm-hmm. And we mentioned that he was the three-time Super Bowl winner. And I said, Nate, you gotta you gotta come up here with all three Super Bowl rings on one time just to flash them in people's face and and flex on them. And Nate said, he goes, uh, that's that's a different rate, buddy. And so <laughs> <laughs> it's like we we charge different rates to break out the Super Bowl rings at yeah. this thing. And so you you've done it for free for us several times. And so uh, we we always appreciate seeing the the jewelry getting flashed. Now, Brian, uh, before we get into the lines themselves, let's talk a little bit about this injury report. Yeah. Um, we're talking a little bit about what is a very large injury report for the Cowboys. Yes. Um, let's start with well, we'll start with the bad news and then we'll roll into the good news. The bad news in this one, um, it, it does not look like uh Eric Kendrick is uh, Eric Kendricks is on track to play, and he's arguably been the most stable, solid guy on defense for you this entire season, and he's the green dot. Now you say, okay, well, if he's got to step out, the green dot that can step in for him is Nick Vigil. Well, Nick yeah. Vigil has not practiced this week either. Um, you know, Trayvon Diggs pops up on the injury report with an illness, um, which he missed practice today. Uh, Zach Martin missed practice. He missed it Wednesday as rest. Thursday, it's due to a back. So a lot of different things flaring up on the injury report for the Cowboys. Um, but some of the positive... Kalen Carson, full participant, looks like he's going to be back. And mm-hmm. then Deron Bland is going to be back this week. It looks like they have uh, activated his practice window, and he's been a full participant this week. So looks like you're you're getting a little healthy there in the secondary, finally, even with the illness to Trayvon Diggs. But um, just overall, how big of a, a detriment, how big of a loss would it be if Eric Kendricks isn't able to go in this game? Huge loss. It's a huge loss. The, you know, the, the games that you have won – your linebacker play has been very, very good. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about defending the run, which Detroit's very good at, um, their blockers are outstanding of getting to second levels. You need guys that can get off blocks and make plays. And Kendricks is one of those guys. When when teams have beaten the Cowboys, the Saints, Ravens, it has been because they just haven't got off blocks. And, you know, Kendricks will – he'll do that. I mean, he's the guy that – you know, he's a veteran player. He understands scheme. Uh, you know, he's able to read scheme and kind of understand, you know, when this this is a team that runs uh, – when they're, their running game is a lot of pin and pull. It's a lot of trapping. I expect with the four-man line, uh, Dallas is going to see their share of trapping. Uh, you know, the inside guys, wham blocks – you know, guys coming in motion, tied in. Usually when you watch the Lions, you could follow the the motion tied in and he'll take you to the ball. And so kind of keep an eye on that this week because they do a lot of 12 personnel stuff. How will Dallas match 12 personnel? Dallas will play base defense. Who's your primary linebacker in the base defense? Eric Kendricks. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, it's going to be a tough one. Uh, I don't anticipate him playing. Um, I do anticipate Zach Martin playing. So that's if you want to kind of trade something off there. The thing with with Bland, I think that's great news there. Um, Carson, he was started off with the workout group and then was able to practice. So that's good. I kind of thought maybe there was a setback there. To play the Lions, I think you're going to need a lot of cornerbacks. And I think you're going to need a lot of cornerbacks because – you're going to want to treat that Sam Laporta as a wide receiver in this game. Yeah. So the mo- the more guys you have that can, you know, could Jordan Lewis 
walk over there and cover him. Absolutely. Jordan Lewis is a dog. He's a competitor. You know, he'll fight. He's one of the better defensive players you've got through the first five weeks of the season, if you want to be completely honest with everybody. But uh, losing Kendricks will be huge. And uh, I've reached out to some people over there to try and figure out the green dot situation. I don't know if I'll get it tonight. Maybe tomorrow for one of our shows, uh, we'll be able to talk about it. But yeah, it's a uh, it's it's tough if if you know it just seems like it's just so many things happening with this defense now that's you know linebackers, edges, corners. I mean, it just it, it's it's kind of nonstop in that way, and you know, unfortunately. But you know, you got a you got an offense. It's got to find a way to put up a lot of points in this game, and hopefully, they can do that. Yeah, and I think that you know when you look at uh, how this matchup breaks up, you, you mentioned just how Laporta is going to be treated more like a wide receiver. We already know. I would not. I would treat him like a wide receiver. Yeah, and, and you absolutely should um, with the type of threat that he can be there. And obviously they've got, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown yep. and Jameson Williams is a guy that they like. And, you know, they, they've got a lot of, you know, really impressive, uh, you, know, you know, pass catchers. And Jared Goff has shown how comfortable he can be. How big is this game for you, Brian, in terms of, being able to even as depleted as your edge rushers are right now to get home with four and to pressure yeah. with four because Goff has been so good against the blitz the last couple of years. Yeah, it's it's uh the the distance between unpressured golf to pressured golf goes from the top of the league as one of the most efficient and best quarterbacks to one of the worst quarterbacks no quarterback has a bigger drop in his ratings and numbers as golf when it comes to no pressure to pressure and yeah this is a game you know and and, and where's this pressure going to come from uh you know uh, i i kind of feel like last week when we talked about the steelers we talked about some problems with their offensive line. We talked about some problems with the tackles. We talked about problems with the guards. We talked about a rookie center. You know, there were things that you were able to get pressure. And, and you saw guys, you know, with Wheat and, you know, Lawson and, and others been able to step up. This will be a little bit different challenge. But Taylor Decker will give up some pressure. Yeah. He just will. You know, and, and, and you know, when you look at Graham Glass now, we'll, he'll play the – He'll probably play the guard now that Frank Ragnow is back at center. That's two guys on the left side that give up pressure. Can you find a way to affect this quarterback? The problem is they run the ball extremely well. They're high play action team, and that kind of puts you in, in harm's way a little bit. We were talking with Eric Kendricks day on the show. Uh, you know, he came on with us. And he was talking about drops and what play action does to you and how they get you. It's all of a sudden they hit you on a play and then they hit you on another running play and they hit you on the third running play. And then all of a sudden they give you the third, fourth running play and it's play action. And now you're selling out to get the run and the ball then goes behind. No team in the league is better at throwing the ball in the middle of the field than the Detroit Lions. The majority of their routes are in cuts. More to, majority of the routes are crossing routes. They're big run after catch. They're not going to throw the ball down the field, you know, with any type of, you know. Now, maybe they'll try it with, with Williams after they've seen Dallas give up a couple of plays. But you're going to get a lot of play action, and then you're going to get routes behind that, behind the linebackers in front of the safeties. And how well Dallas plays will be dependent on how much pressure they're able to get. And if you could take advantage – of Decker, uh, you know Penny Sewell is uh, outstanding at right tackle. Um, I mentioned Rag now at center; he's really, really good. So the pressure is going to have to come from somewhere. Someone's going to have to find a way to get home uh, on this Detroit Lion offensive line. Yeah, and we talk about the the passing game. This is obviously still um, a, a really good running football team, yep. and, and one that look you you've played better against the run the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, Pittsburgh was committed to trying to make some stuff work and they were unable to do so against you. Um, yeah. You know, those aren't necessarily, those aren't juggernaut run games that you've gone no. against the last couple of weeks, but you're not going to apologize for playing well in physical football games on the road in tough conditions. Like the, that's all good stuff to build on and prepare you for this game coming up against the lines. But this is a different beast. 
This is a, a very good running football team, which, you know, we were talking to uh, the, the play-by-play voice of the Lions, Dan Miller, on uh, Thursday morning on Sean and RJ on 105 to the Fan. And I asked him, I said, if I set the over-under at 40 rush attempts for the Lions, what would you take? And he said, I think if they're, if they're playing their game, if they feel like, you know, they're, they're not too far behind or they're not, they don't have this massive lead. Like if it's just a normal game, that's about where they want to be is about 40 rush attempts. So the lines are going to keep on coming and coming and coming and bringing that rush in attack. And Dallas has got to be prepared for it specifically if you're not going to have Eric Kendricks in this one. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be the, the way that they block, um, they are not interested. Uh, the one thing that you were, and I think I said this earlier, you know, when you play the teams that you've beat have not done a very good job of getting second level blocks with their offensive line. Browns, Browns really didn't run the ball. They, they were out of the game. They had a hard time, you know, even doing any kind of offense. The Giants, the Giants tried to run the football. No success. Couldn't get blockers up on the second level. Steelers mm-hmm. couldn't get blockers up on the second level. Saints, Ravens could. This is a team you're about to play that there's no regard, and you've heard me if you've listened to me on a couple of different platforms, whether it's radio or Fox Lombardi and our show that we do. If you've heard me talk about this, the Lions can care less about the down linemen. They're good enough to where they will they will they will chip a guy to get to the second level. They will two hand shove Mozzie Smith over to the guard, and then they will go up on the second level. Or they'll yeah. shove Golston to the tackle and go up on the second level. They are they are they are trying their their damnedest to get blockers up, and that's I'd like to see Dallas do that a little more than myself. You know, what happens with BB, occasionally he gets stuck on that down block or that that help block or that, that combo block, and he just needs to shove to his all-pro guards and go. You know, don't, don't worry about trying to help. You know, shove it. You're strong enough. Shove it and go because the ball with the ball with Dowdle can cut behind you there. You know, your, your guards are going to get those blocks and, and you've got to get a guy on the second level. These are this is why the Lions and those teams that can really the you know the Ravens. That's why they run the ball because they get guys up on the second level. These backs yep. are good enough to break a first level block or first level and then go to the second. If you know the good teams too, Dallas would have had a ton of rushing yards in the Pittsburgh game if the wide receivers had blocked on the edges. You know. If they'd had a, uh, they'd had some second level blocks, there would have been more opportunity for them to gain even more yards in this game. The good teams know how to get personnel up on the second level, and the Lions they play on their feet. You don't see them flopping around on the ground. You know they're not out of they're out, not out of position. They'll trap. They'll pull. They'll block back. You know, there's a lot of really good things about Ben Johnson and the way he runs football, and they got two quality backs. Yeah. It makes a difference. It really makes a difference when you have two backs that show the patience like they do. When you when you look at Gibbs and Jameer Montgomery. Gibbs and David Montgomery, yeah. The most patient that you know, they 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 stand very erect there in the in the, at the and then and then golf brings them the ball. They take the ball, they're looking, boom. They're looking, boom. They're looking, boom. They they let things develop. They let the tight end block, the motion block. They let everything kind of happen. Oh, and, and Gibbs, Gibbs with that patience, and then that yeah, burst that he the has, burst. the ability. He is huh. so fast that he'll sit there. It's it's developing kind of slow, and you see him being patient, and then he will hit it so quick, and then he's gone before you yeah. know it. G- yeah. Gibbs has a, I, I like both backs, but Gibbs is really, really special yeah. to me. Gibbs is, you know, and, and we were talking about this, you know, when the draft, when that happened with him and B. John Robinson, they're like, damn, you got two running backs in the first round? Don't you know that's blasphemy? You can't take a running back in the first round? I go, I take either one of these, these guys. Stud, either yeah. one. Either one. Give me B. John Robinson. Give me <laughs> Gibbs. Sure. Give me you know, everybody's, ah, oh, what are the Lions doing? They've already, you know, huh, they're making their team better. That's what they're doing. They're, they don't worry about their running game. Their running game, as you mentioned with their play by play guy, you know, it could be a, it could very well be a, uh, 
40, 40 rush, you know, attempts. I mean, yeah, they, you, I think they you could demoralize right somebody. Now. You could demoralize a defense. Look what happened in the Saints game. Look how demoralized that game became. Yep. The Ra they came back against the Ravens. But just think about a team running the ball 40 times on you. You yeah, know, it, I mean, it's crazy. It wears you out. It wears it, you it out. It especially, out. Especially if you're undermanned right now which this Cowboys team very clearly is in that front seven. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast, the Love of the Stars and Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, uh, let's talk a little bit about what the Lions present over on the defensive side of the ball. I think they do have a couple of really good stud players on the defensive side of the ball. Um, you know, I, I think Kirby Joseph is – on track to potentially be an all pro type safety this year. Aiden Hutchinson is uh, arguably the the best in terms of the way he's played this year, the best edge rusher they've seen yet this season in terms of the, his quality of play within this calendar year. Um, he He's fantastic. Um, I, I think the linebackers are solid, but there's some, there's some vulnerability on these corners. I feel like I, I think that you can take advantage of something. CD lamb did last year. Um, and this is a team that when you watch them, I was surprised. One of the things that kind of jumped out to me a little bit, and I started researching around and I was trying to check and see, um, it looked like they've been in man a lot more this year. Aaron played a lot Lund more man. man. Yeah. And, you know and why? Yeah. 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 It has jumped the amount that they've played man coverage this year, which CD lamb is right up there near the top as one of the best receivers in the NFL against man coverage. He, he is incredibly difficult to cover. So, I, you know, that was another thing we'd asked Dan Miller said, Hey, do you think that they're going to say, Hey, let's, let's, let's tailor this game plan a little bit defensively. Let's, let's scale back a little bit, drop into more zone, do a little bit of what Pittsburgh maybe did to try and take lamb away. Let's, let's do some of those things. And he was like, no, I, I think Aaron Glenn is going to say, we're going to play our, our game because this is such a different secondary than they had last year. It's just it it's different personnel. Yeah. And he feels like they're going to be able to match up better if they're going to put people out there in man coverage on CD Lamb, then I, you know, you can bracket him and do all the other things that you want to try and do. I think the Cowboys will have some success passing in this football game if the Lions are going to do that. The Lions are going to match your 11 personnel with base. They're going to match your 12 personnel with base. They can play base because they trust their corners, and they got Brian Branch who could play as a slot player, who could play. Brian Branch could take a couple of different covers for you he can cover on the outside he can cover in the slot and he can also cover your tight end he's a little he's a little minka fitzpatrick like in that sense that he can kind of better, play some corner safety better just, cover guy i think yeah swiss army knife guy with better coverage yeah better coverage better coverage minka fitzpatrick is a badass and i think that brian branch is a badass too this team last year when they looked at their in their secondary they knew they weren't very good at corner they killed Cam Sutton in this game last year. Yep. Week 17, it was a murder, uh, a football murder, that is, uh, with the way that they went after him in this in this game. And they went out and they, they, they traded for Carlton Davis, and Carlton Davis is a guy that people have kind of gone after a little bit. You're right. They play a ton of play a ton of man coverage. Um, you know, Aaron Glenn, it, they they just they weren't good enough at corner. They had to protect their corners last year. Now, the biggest problem that the Lions have is other than, than Aiden Hutchinson, they don't have another pass rusher. They do not have another pass rusher, and that's a problem for them. Yeah. Because if you look at pressures, if you believe in those metrics, Aiden Hutchinson is one of the top pressure players in the league. You, everyone else, they're near the bottom when it comes to that. Their pressure is really in one guy. And that's where Dallas has to look at this offensively. How much are you willing to commit to keeping Aiden Hutchinson under control? Are you interested in just if you're if you're going to single block Steele, who had some problems with him last year? You be be aware if you're going to go Guyton single blocks. Be aware, you know the thing with Guyton is he hasn't played against anybody he's better than. That's that's been the problem with his, you know. Everybody he's played against has been right now better than him. You know? I'm, I'm going to say this really quickly about Hutchinson. And did you get a chance to go back and watch the 
uh, the, did you revisit the Lions Cowboys film from last year? This no, week? no. So I had I had looked back at something. I had I had had it whispered in my ear recently that they felt like last year. I think the Cowboys felt like Aiden Hutchinson kind of went after your quarterback a little bit. Yeah, right? like I think they felt like in in a bit of a dirty manner that they they didn't think that was a clean game for Aiden Hutchinson. No. I think they're going to, when you talk about, do you chip, do you do different yeah. things? Are you gonna, I think they're going to do everything they can to keep Aiden Hutchinson away from their quarterback. Let me tell you what. I watched the Arizona Cardinals cut Derek uh, Barnes yep. in the knee, and it knocked him. He's, he's out. Knee injury. Gone. You know? You know, they they this is a team that D- Barnes was a good rusher for them, and mm-hmm. now he's gone. I mean, you know, sometimes that happens. Barnes is out. Davenport, who they signed, you know, they, they don't have somebody on the other side. They just don't. How committed are you to not allowing Aiden Hutchinson to wreck shop in this game? That's that's going to be that's going to be it for me. Because your offense has got to punting in this situation is probably bad. Kicking field goals in this game, probably bad. You know, unless it's a game winner. But you're, you're going to have to sustain some drives. You're going to have to score some points. You're going to have to not be bad in the red zone. Those are all things that are paramount in this game. Can't turn it over. Can't punt. You know, you've got to, you've got to be on par with their, their offense. Now, maybe their offense with a week off will come out flat. Maybe it won't be humming like it normally is. But defensively, you've got to block that 97 and take some shots at number 23, the corner. Davis, because a lot of teams have. Yeah. You know, they talk about Arnold, the rookie on the other side. There's some separation issues there that he's had. There's some things that he's had. Arnold's so, been yeah. grabby. Yeah. Ar- Arnold's, had, Arnold's had some penalty issues, but I will say this, and I know you always do a deep dive into this. It's always one of my favorite things to listen to that you do on the G-Bag Nation, but the the official report. Which John you, Hussey, a couple, yeah. A couple weeks ago, you gave us the heads up about the uh, the 12 men in the huddle. Yeah. Call, which yeah. which we got. So John Hussey is one of the the if you go look at his numbers, his crew penalizes at one of the lowest rates in the NFL. But there's two specific penalties I think that are of note here. He's thrown more unnecessary roughness yes. penalties than anybody else in the NFL. Yes. So yes. there's going to be no because he loses play. control of the game. No he's after a, play yeah. chippiness. Yeah. Yeah. And he's thrown two. Two defensive pass interference calls all year. Yeah. So if Terry and Arnold wants to to be a little, it, it, that plays into Terry and Arnold's game a little bit. Okay, yeah. if you're going to allow me to kind of mug the receiver a little bit, mm-hmm. I'm going to take advantage of that. I think you're dead on. Carlton Davis is is the the guy that maybe you want to take advantage of a little bit. What What do you think about what they have? We we talk about Davis and we talk about well, Arnold. What do you think about what they've got in the slot with um, Robertson? Yeah, I think Robinson, you know, the, these guys are really tough when it comes to tight window throws, too, though. They, they'll they play it, but Dak, Dak, Dak throws the receivers that are either 50% tight windows, uh, 42 tight window, or 29. His CD Lamb's 20. Dak, Dak is always throwing into tight windows. It doesn't matter. Yeah. He's used. So I, I think the thing, I think the thing with, with you mentioned with Robinson, you know, I, I'm yes, yes, you know, try, try that one. That that one to me, I mean, that's a guy that I think he's a pretty aggressive player. Uh, I think he's, I think he's one of those guys that battles you on the outside. Smaller, smaller. The thing that I worry about in this game, Bobby, is that when they play, say they play base, mm-hmm. you know, and I do worry about. Okay, maybe base or maybe some nickel, but they play a ton of base. If they match up with base, I worry about them just saying, you know what, we're gonna take, we're gonna take um, our safety Joseph. We're gonna shade him to Lamb's side, and we're gonna shade him there. And then they take, they take their the uh, take Branch and put him on Ferguson. Branch and I think Branch uh, Ferguson's a good player. Branch can handle Ferguson if he needs. To. No question. So now we're gonna double. We're gonna double your best receiver. We're gonna we're gonna single your your tight end who is a could be a, a shop wrecker with one of our better cover guys 
who's can be physical, and once he catches the ball, tackle him, you know, and then say, okay, Tolbert and others beat us. You know, that's where are, this thing could very turn can turn into. How concerned are you? We talk about tight window throws and stuff like that. Let's talk about really quickly Kirby Joseph. Is Kirby Joseph the greatest threat here in this game to set Dak up for one of those classic tunnel vision bait throws where Joseph kind of because he loves to make plays on the ball. He, sure. he will he will he will absolutely mm-hmm. kind of lurk and attack. I think more interceptions and passes defense to this guy. Yeah, yeah, and I mean if you look at um cover GPA, I think he's second in the mm-hmm. NFL of of negative EPA, which is a per play efficiency number. He's been. Fantastic. It's him and Xavier McKinney. Statistically, the advanced metrics say they're the two best safeties. Xavier McKinney is having a hell of a year, yeah. He absolutely is. Um, So when you look at it, I think in 188 coverage snaps, he's given up three receptions as the nearest Mm -hmm. defender this year, Kirby Joseph has. But Joseph is a guy who will, he'll lurk. He loves to bait the quarterback into throwing stuff and, and make a play on the ball. Is he the biggest threat in this game to... Some of that stuff we've seen from Dak before, where Dak kind of locks in and goes, "All right, I'm, yeah. I'm locked in on my guy," and he just doesn't see somebody in the periphery sitting there. Him and and then Angeloni, the linebacker. Anzal- the, hey, these linebackers. Angeloni is Anzalone yeah, Anzal- and Cam- Anzal- Anzal- can, he can cover. He can yeah. cover, and you know, and I, I worry about the not seeing linebackers because these linebackers play extremely tight to the line of scrimmage. You know they're yeah. they are both up on the line of scrimmage, and I worry about I worry about Dak kind of losing track of how close these guys are to the line. You know, yeah. and all of a sudden he's going to try and fire a slant or fire something. You know, tie, fire a tight end pass, spot pass, and not see that linebacker standing there. I, I'd yeah. love to see what the numbers are. I, I would bet I've never looked this up. I bet if we looked it up. Dak would have a higher percentage of inter- of his interceptions going to safeties and linebackers than most quarterbacks in the NFL because it's those it's those help defenders or those you know guys sitting in zones that he just he doesn't see him the corners like he 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 can fit some you know throws into tight windows against man tight he fit yeah corners. that against that that ball that went to Lamb along the sideline it was Holy incredible geez. he Jeez. he's had a ton of these this year you mentioned yeah. the tight window throw I just had to look it up here tight window throw percentage he's. 0.1 percentage points behind Brock Purdy for the most yeah. in the NFL this season. His That's- receivers are always in they're always every pass he throws is a tight window throw. I was going through the numbers. That fourth yeah. down, that fourth down throw that they scored the touchdown on. The, the one point, on one, one point six yards of separation on that play. <laughs> one point six yards of separation on that game winning pass. And that was with the safety going with Lamb. <laughs> That was with the safety following Lamb, and then I'm just still, yeah, yeah. They, they need they need to, um, like I say, they they are going to have to play. They they, I like I say the penalties and stuff. I hate to be wet blanket guy, but these penalties aren't going to get any better. They just don't need Probably to be not. critical. They just don't need to be critical ones. They don't need to be big gain, and then all of a sudden, Steel gets hands to the face, or one you know, or or, you know, Smith holds or, you know, they, they just don't, they can't afford any negative plays in this game. They just can't. I mean, usually in offense, the Lions, the Lions are totally cool with this because the Lions will play four downs the whole game. You know, they'll play like they're, Ben Johnson knows to have four plays ready every drive. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. first, second, third, like they will run the football on third and long. They will run it on third and long, and they'll get like nine or ten yards, and get like a lot of it back, and then it's fourth and two. And what does Campbell do? He'll go for it. Yep. You know, you just got to be just when you think you know they're going to throw. It's kind of like McCarthy the other day. You know that that third and six little flip that he called. Beautiful call. I mean, now if it doesn't work, we're all mfing him. You know, we're yep. all going after him. But it's a beautiful call. Well blocked. You know, everything about it was perfect. You know, just a great call. But that's that's kind of how Ben Johnson plays. Oh, third and nine. Eh, just to run a little toss here, a little trap, you know, a little something. And all of a sudden, it's now it's fourth and one. You know? Yeah, and it's a different ball game. It's a different, different conversation. Yeah. All right, uh, before we get to the mailbag, let's, uh, let's pick this game. I do think that uh, 
I, I think the offense is going to be able to have some success here. This is going to be a really tough game for Dallas to win, though. I think just because yeah. of the ways that Detroit challenges you, um, you know, offensively, just with the pass catchers, the passing game that they have, but also just the way they they block things up, like you mentioned on the second level and these patient runners. I, I think both teams are going to be able to score points in this one, but I've got Detroit 31 28 taking this one, Brian. What do you have? Yeah, I think Dallas, Dallas to at least have a shot has to get 28 points. The problem with that is I feel like Detroit's going to score 31. Yeah. You know, I feel like that. I feel like I, I think that both, I think both defenses are going to be under pressure in this game. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that the Lions, you know, have got some, a little bit of like some rust. But I, I think, I think this is, a, I think it's a loss for Dallas. I went to, I'm going to go Detroit 31, Dallas 26. Oh, right there. We're, we're right there close to each other. Yeah. You are listening to the Love the Star podcast. The Love the Stars and Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's go to our Dean Julia Love the Star mailbag. And, and before we do that, I do want to say we, we never shout this out. We really need to shout this out, Brian. Uh, anybody. I know a, a lot of our listeners are always going out to the stadium uh, Sunday. Go out to the Miller Light West Plaza. Brian Broadus is going to be out there doing the pregame show three hours. So if you want to come by, wave at Brian, say hi to him while he's on set. Uh, I'll be out there for a segment, but uh, Brian and uh, 105.3 The Fan, Eric Chiafalo, they do a great job hosting uh, that three-hour pregame show live from the plaza every home game, so you guys check them out. Yeah, but just say hello quickly because you need to get inside because it's going to be 98 degrees outside while we're doing this uh, pregame show. It's going to be hot. Yeah, so just come by, wave, say, hey, Brian, you know, Eric, love your work, or Bobby, love your work, and then if you go on inside, I will not blame you one bit. To and, go into air conditioning, and if Brian is just sitting there and neither I'm sweating, Brian or likely Eric, sweating, yeah. If, if Brian and Eric are not talking and they just happen to wave at you and they're not actually speaking, that's because they're interviewing somebody and they're they they can't talk. And it's not that they're being rude; they'd love to sit there and talk to you all afternoon. They just can't write that they're they're doing an interview. But definitely wave and say hello because yeah. uh, we always appreciate it. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go to our Dean Julia Love the Star mailbag. Uh, get the thoughts, comments, questions from our dear sweet listeners and talk about some of the things they want to talk about. First question here from Jake, any insight into why John Stevens is firmly behind span Ford? I wouldn't call us in desperate need of more pass catchers, but Stevens seemed to bring that prior to injury. And it doesn't seem like any of our tight ends are overly affecting blocking this far. Um, Brian, that's what we're looking at here though, right now, right? This is about span Ford, just a better blocker. Stevens is a, is a, he's a big receiver basically. Been a healthy scratch. Yeah. And a healthy scratch. That's all. That's all I can say is that they they you know they set something up for Span Ford. Nice little play with the motion. It's like the Steelers said, "You're not going to throw the ball that number 89. <laughs> and they, and they yeah. did. So you know, uh, two catches, twenty yards. I mean, Span Ford. Pff, you get that. You're you're doing all right. So yeah, uh, been a healthy scratch for John Stevens, and you know, unfortunately for him, uh, last year it seemed like he was well on his way to making the team, maybe being a very productive player for you, but he comes to training camp. They There was a couple of days where he wasn't really great, but, you know, he was making progress, not like great like he was last year, but he's healthy now. He's just a scratch every week, and it, and I was told it's going to be hard for him to, to be on the field uh, unless something happens, another injury or something happens to one of the tight ends. Next question here from uh, Thomas. Uh, I actually know Thomas. I, I used to work mm. with Thomas's wife, Abigail, uh, years ago. Uh, Thomas is asking, this feels like the turning point in the season offensively, like last year at the Chargers game where mm. we squeaked out a great win. Dak was carrying us, but our offense slowly got better and better. If so, is September intentionally vanilla by Mike McCarthy? Uh, easing into it, gaining cohesiveness. Um, look. You Thomas answer that one. And yeah. everybody. Yeah. It's a complicated question, and it's one that probably can't be answered to the extent that it needs to be answered until, you know, it, it, like Jason Garrett used to say, we'll talk about it over a couple lemonades. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that's a, a lemonade discussion sometime into the future when there's different coaches and, and different people here. You're but, already calling it. You're already calling different coaches. Is that what you're doing? I'm just saying one day there will be a different coach here with that with that different coach gets here that then, then you can talk. I'll, I'll just say this. I, I think that players, coaches, they all have different ideas about what yeah. the offense should look like. And sometimes sure. some ideas are winning out over others. And then over the course of time, maybe people look at it and go, maybe we should uh, let these ideas win out instead. 
Um, but you know, that's uh, I, I think it doesn't, it's not too difficult to see that it's not just vanilla last year, the first five weeks of the season. It was just flat out a different offense than the one that uh, was being executed later in the season. And when you see things like Dak against the Giants, not attempting a single pass over 20 yards, just go back and look at the last 10 weeks of last year. Does that look like the same offense to you? Does it just look yeah. like a, a a different? Does that look like, oh, it's the same offense. You're just calling things a little more conservatively. No, this is. At different times, I think you're just running different offenses, and uh, that that can be a challenge at times. Brian, you want to add anything to that? No, we'll say, Bob. <laughs> well, well, like I said, over some lemonades. Uh, one, one. Hey, one day can later. I can I do say something real quick yeah. about this though? Yeah, it was funny. I was looking through some metrics because trying to figure out why the second half for CD Lamb. I was trying to figure that one out. Mm-hmm. You know why the second half of uh, of uh, that you know it's 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 been a, been a struggle, you know, yep. for him. And I learned something though the the metrics will tell you that you know against the man coverages and stuff like that that his numbers are on pace for where he was last year against man coverage, but his routes against off coverage or targets against off coverage have been cut in half. It's like mm. six receptions out of eleven targets for 54 yards, I believe, hmm. in off coverage, which is, since this point last year, it's half. The targets are cut in half against off coverage. So you wonder if some of the routes, that when they're playing off coverage, does Dak going somewhere else with sure. the football? You know, But that, it was, I was fascinated. Six receptions, 54 yards in, in off coverage. CD Lamb feasts on the quick passing game. Now, and I was talking with Nick Harris of Fort Worth Star Telegram about this today you know, on our show. Uh, we're on the break with Ambar Garcia and, and Derek Eagleton. And Nick says, hey, you, you, know, you want CD Lamb, the quick passing game is a big part, whether that's uh, you know, man coverage or off coverage. Mm-hmm. You know? and, but it's, it's an interesting little nugget that he's only got six or seven. You would think that in off coverage that he would be killing them. And he yeah. has. He has in the past. But half the targets this year, well, at least through five weeks of the season. Yeah, and, and a lot of this, you know, um, like we talked about, the the, t- the fourth down play on uh, where, where they scored against Pittsburgh, that's a read. And, yeah. and what that is is – they are uh, Jalen Tolbert talked about it after the game. Basically, uh, the safety up top, whoever the safety shades to, who, to whoever the safety follows, the ball's going the other way. Mm-hmm. So, the safety a lot of times is going to go with CD Lamb. And so, like, you know, the progression is going to dictate ball needs to come over here. And so, because of that, that's going to cut a lot of his opportunities right there, especially the way that uh, Pittsburgh was, was playing this. I know we had talked about it a little bit earlier this week. Some people were asking about, you know, why why aren't the the Cowboys why weren't they getting it to CD more against Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, you could tell their game plan was we, we're not going to let CD beat us. Like we're taking CD out. And and mm-hmm. they had really committed and did a good job of making sure that there weren't a lot of easy opportunities for CD and Dallas to their credit took advantage of some of that with Tolbert and yeah. and took advantage of some of the easier looks they got there. They need to do that again this week if yep. it's going to be the same sort of thing. Um Brian, uh, next question here from, let's go with Big Squeak. Big Squeak said he's been a listener for uh, to both of us for years and really enjoys the podcast, so thank, thank you Thank you very Big much, Squeak. squeak. Yeah. Uh, it says, do you have more faith in the interior defensive line or the edges in finding ways to put pressure on Goff? Brian, I thought Oso Digizua did a great job against Pittsburgh, um, yeah. generating his own pressure and then also just eating up double team blocks and allowing other guys to be free. Um, in fact, I think the number said that he was double teamed on like half of his pass rushes. So Pittsburgh tried to neutralize him and Dallas found some success there. Carl Lawson didn't have a bad game. Um, mm. I think right now that's probably my biggest confidence is in those two, Carl Lawson and Odigizua, um, to, to generate pressure consistently. But I mean, it's going to be tough. If you ask me though, I guess I'll say I'm a little more confident in the interior defensive line getting pressure. Well, after Linville Joseph just steamrolled. You know, steamroll that guard. Yeah. You know. Suamalo, is that who it was? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. So maybe maybe we're getting something from him with some pressure. I thought Osa did play a very good game for you. Uh I 
we talked about it a bunch that the inside for the Steelers was going to be a problem for them. Mm-hmm. Not for Dallas, a problem for Pittsburgh. You know, it was going to be a problem. Uh, the pressure, I think, is going to come from whoever goes up against Taylor Decker. That's, I think it's going to have to be on the Dallas's right side of the defense. They also get in a situation, too, if you can get him in, uh, if Gibbs has to pass block as a running back, he gives up pressures, too. So if you could find a way to isolate him on some one-on-one stuff, you might be able to win with him as a blitz pickup guy. I'm going to throw out something crazy, and it may be <laughs> a bad idea. But I know we've had his name come up enough over the years. I, I believe his reputation is one of being a toxic player, and I know he can't play the run worth a damn. Would you just, in need of needing somebody to just get to the quarterback and be a situational pass rusher, would you entertain going and just, hey, let me see if we can sign Yannick Ngakwe off of the Ravens practice squad? I looked at him. You know, I looked at him at one time. He can get to the quarterback. That's about yeah. it. He, he yeah. won't play the run very well. He's had five teams in five years, but that's somebody who's played with Zimmer as well. Yeah. And just somebody who maybe you say that may be that may be why they don't want him here. That, that, that's, I, I that's know, true. I, yeah. I know, I know, um, I know my gang is seven. I asked, I said, guys, can you give me three practice squad poaches? Give me the top three practice squad poaches. Henry was number one on four of the seven lists. And then Ngakwe was number two, and then Chason was number three. So I think Chason's with Vegas, Ngakwe's with the Ravens, and then you poached, you poached Henry you from Cincinnati. Henry, yeah. yeah, from Cincinnati. So, it but, makes, it, but it they, makes but they gave they, the, they said the three edge poaches were those three guys in that order. Let's uh, let's finish up with one more question here from Chase. Uh, since Bland is coming back, how was he looking in camp before the injury? Uh, Brian, going back, I, I seem to remember Bland was up there as one of the more impressive players I think we were seeing yeah. out of training. Yeah. He, he looked every bit as good as we've always known him to be. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's just going to be a matter. They're looking at 25 plays in this game, it, you know, and we always get that number, the 25 plays, but they're trying to get him some plays, get him to the bye, and then get him ready full on for – for what's going to happen at San Francisco. So depending on how he feels and stuff like that, he is definitely under a pitch count. I think you have to be really – I think there's opportunity here to do some stuff. If he's going to cover for 25 plays, maybe that will free you up to do some other stuff. You know, I'm, I'm going to throw one more question at you, and this is my own question. And uh, maybe this is too quick, but these last two weeks we've been pretty impressed with Amani O'Rourke, right? We, 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 we've liked what we've seen. AO. AO has been good. He, he absolutely surpassed Andrew Booth. Yes. Given some of the struggles we've seen from Carson, is there any party that thinks maybe O'Rourke should play over Carson right now? Kind of it's like the old Tyler Guyton situation for me, bro. You know? I, yeah, I let him get I his reps, let him grow. Yeah, but you know, there's this, there's this, there's the, there's the pro, per, there's the pro personnel guy to me that wants to see Guyton and Carson play. And like, just kind of keep going. And then there's the fan side of me it's saying, your best five are these guys. Your best yeah. corners are these guys. You know what I'm saying? So I get stuck. I, I want to believe as a player personnel guy, I would beg the coaches to play the young guys. You know? And the problem with that is these coaches are all under one year deals. They all might get fired. And, you know, I'm probably not going to get fired. But, I think it's a very delicate situation that you walk that line because playing Tyler Smith at left tackle might make this team better right he now. Good. He looked right. good. But I'll tell you what, though, he also – and he's a good player. And, and fortunately, fortunately, though, that Herbick got hurt mm-hmm. because he was wrecking shop, you know, and he got on Tyler Smith a couple of times. So to me – you know, you had a guy that hadn't played a lot of I, – I, I was in camp the whole time, Bobby, as you well know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't – I don't ever – I never saw Tyler Smith take one rep at left tackle, and I feel like I watched every single play. Yeah, I don't know that I saw him – it it may be going back to before the regular season last year, the last time I think I can remember seeing him play there. Yeah. It's been, it's been a while. But, yeah. you know, I, I think for just being asked to jump out there and do it – It's amazing. It, 
he played pretty well. And, and yeah. Bass had some struggles in pass protection at times. Got early, tired. But I think he, yeah. he I, I think he overall the unit cohesion looked better as yeah. a unit. And and yeah. I think that that was that's something to consider. All right, that does it for us here today on the Love the Star podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate you guys and all your questions and uh, all of your support. Uh, for Brian Broaddus, I'm Bobby Belt. We'll talk to you guys again later. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.